This is The Naked Patient, Beyond the Operating Room. Listen as Dr. Nicholas Howland talks with real patients about their real experiences with plastic surgery. Hello, welcome to The Naked Patient Podcast. I'm Dr. Nicholas Howland. With me today is my good friend and patient, Marie Davidson, just like the Harley. I won't say that part. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds terrible. You know, what's funny about that is when I first got married, my husband, my husband, my dad, he was like, you know that you have to name one of your kids Harley. Oh, you <laughs> should. I was like, no, that's not going to happen. And how many kids do you have? I have two, two this boys. This is us, we started. We'll go back and cut that out if we need to. <laughs> this is hard. How old are your kids? Um, so my oldest is 14. Mm-hmm. And then my youngest is, he just turned nine. So Okay. And let's for, let's start with you. Tell us kind of what surgery you had. I had the mommy makeover. I got a tummy tuck, mm-hmm. and I had the breast reaugmentation. Mm-hmm. So. You had had implants beforehand. No. Nope. Oh, okay. So nope. just a. I never had implants. Not a reaugmentation then. Was it not the reaugmentation? Not if you didn't have implants. Oh, already. okay. So I just had a reduction then. Okay. Perfect. And then I had my. Arms. I had the skin removed on my arms. Love it. And you had lost some weight. Yes, I lost a lot of weight. How I lost weight? 83 pounds. Diet, exercise, it bariatric was surgery. Strict diet, exercise, natural. Nice. Yeah. Tell a me. A lot of hard work. <laughs> it is a lot of hard work. Good job. Tell me your journey. Like I wanted, I wanted to bring you on. You kind, of, you and I had like a little moment um, in my office last week. Mm-hmm. I hadn't even. I, there's patients that I know a lot about just from either interacting or knowing them prior to surgery. And so in my mind, I'm like, okay, that's a person we got to get on the podcast. That's a person that's got a good story. And it's not that you're not interesting. I just didn't know anything about you. And then when I saw you last week for your follow-up, you were, you were kind of emotional and you're kind of in tears and you're just, were so ecstatic about how much this had changed your life that I just was wanted to get you on and share that journey. Yes. I had a breakthrough moment last week. I, when they showed me my board before and after pictures that we took last week, I just got so emotional because it, I have had a really long journey. Yeah. I came from, uh, an abusive relationship and it stemmed from my emotions stemmed from some very really dark shadows Mm -hmm. and not viewing myself in a very bright light for a long time. Mm -hmm. And when I saw those before and after pictures, it was like, Finally realizing that my body and what I have healed over time throughout my journey was in alignment now. Yeah. What I felt on the inside, the beauty and the the um, healing that I had processed on the inside through all the therapy I had gone through was finally what I'm viewing on the outside. I could see that beauty on the outside also now. Nice. And so I was like, finally, the whole package. It was like putting the bow on the top of the present, you know? Yeah. And I was just like aesthetic, like (laughs) so excited. And so that's where those emotions came from. I love it. I'm so happy you shared it. Yeah. So I want to hear some details. (laughs) (laughs) So talk to me, talk to me a little bit more about this. How long ago? Was this relationship, how long did it last for? So when I think about where it started, um, I'd probably start back when I was eight. And I was sitting down with my grandma. And I was in my little pink leotard, my tutu. And I'd just gotten back from ballet. And I was telling my grandma that I wanted to be a ballerina. And my very blunt Japanese grandma sternly told me, look, Marie, 
you cannot be a ballerina. <laughs> Your thighs are too big. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and in that moment, she just like crushed my dreams. Yeah. And that kind of set the tone for what I viewed. Was it malicious or was it just like, no, she, like very matter of fact? Like yeah. Is, she was just very, very blunt. She was like, I don't, I don't want you to work your whole life to be a ballerina and then just like have your dreams completely destroyed when sure. you're older. She was just very straightforward and that's how she was. Yeah. That was her, her culture, her. That's back. hard to understand. Yeah. When you're a kid though. And I didn't understand that. Yeah. It destroyed my dreams. And, but from that way, point forward, I had this idea in my head that I had to meet like a certain standard okay. of who I was. And I worked my entire life to have this image, like the image that society paints for who we should look like or what we should look like. And it kind of destroyed who I was on the inside as far as my self love goes, mm -hmm. that was like my, my foundation of who I was going into my relationship with my husband. I was like a hard worker when it came to my health. I exercised, I had good nutrition. I was fit. But before that you felt like you had lost some of that love of self because of right that right. moment inside i didn't i didn't love myself okay i looked good but i didn't love myself mm -hmm. going into my relationship our marriage in the beginning it was it was good right in the beginning How and old then you? i was i was young i got mm -hmm. married really young do not get married young <laughs> <laughs> bad move <laughs> Um, I was 23 when I got married. So was I. <laughs> That's young. So we got married really young. We made mistakes. Sure. I, I broke his trust in the beginning and he was very, um, controlling and he didn't trust me. He questioned like everything I did. And so whenever I would go out, if somebody looked at me the wrong way, I was cheating, you know? Mm -hmm. And so over time I started to gain weight so that people wouldn't look at me. I intentionally gained weight. And then on top of that, I developed, after I had my oldest son, I was diagnosed with lupus. And ha was put on prednisone yeah. and gained weight from that and wasn't able to lose all the weight from that. So I just kept piling on the weight and our relationship got more volatile over time. The day that everything changed, he stood in front of me and took his life. I watched him leave this world and my whole life changed. That abusive relationship that I had been in, everything was just wrapped up. And brought to an end yeah. in that moment. How long ago was that? It was July 9th, 2020. The year that everything came crashing down. Yeah. That, that moment crushed me. It completely destroyed me. It changed my, my view on how I saw my entire world. my whole sense of self was wiped clean and I had to restructure myself from the bottom up. Yeah. I can't even imagine. I remember 
standing outside and waiting for the paramedics to come out to let me know if he was going to make it. And the police officer walked out and told me that he was gone. And I remember my mom just catching me as I collapsed in her arms. My knees just gave out. And I remember thinking, how am I going to do this by myself? How, how in the world am I going to make it? I am just me. I'm just one person. There is no way I can do this. I've been a stay-at-home mom for 10 years. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. Where were the, where were the boys when all that happened? <sighs> My oldest was outside. He was waiting for me. I had sent them outside um, because I was going to leave. Mm -hmm. We had been arguing, and I was going to leave. And my youngest came running in when he had heard what happened. How old is he? Or was he? He was seven at the time. And he came running inside, and he saw my husband on the ground. I was so angry, so angry that he would, that he would do that to us, but especially that he did it with my children there. Yeah. How, how much of a role did what was going on outside of the family play in this. I mean, July 2020 is like a significant date. You know, um, I've, I thought about this and, a and I lot. Wanna, I don't want to downplay any, any, any part of like the toxicity that that relationship was. Yeah. But I'm just curious, like how much of what was happening in the world maybe played a role at all, if any. No, I believe it did. I've thought about this a lot. He, had to work from home. And he was a person who really needed that social interaction with people. Mm -hmm. And when he had to be... So he went from a job where he was going to to having to work at home. Well, he had to work at home before... Okay. Before everything happened with COVID. Okay. But he was having to go in a certain amount of days mm -hmm. before that. Okay. And then once COVID hit, he had to be at home all the time. Yeah. On top of, you know, not being able to go to the grocery store, not being able to go see family, it just made it worse. It was 10 times worse. And he struggled with um, depression and anxiety and his own, you know, demons that he had yeah. on top of that. And so it was just like, it was a perfect storm. Yeah. COVID definitely played a part in what happened. It was something that I don't believe that he would have been pushed to that point if he hadn't had to be isolated to that extreme. Mm -hmm. I would not wish on my worst enemy for anyone to go through the pain and the grief that you suffer when you lose somebody to suicide. Yeah. It is one of the most traumatizing experiences and deaths that I have ever experienced. Yeah. Let alone the way that I experienced it. And my heart goes out to anyone that has ever had to go through that. So I have a, um, a really close friend who, um, this like Thanksgiving, like two weeks ago, 
um, not even two weeks ago, a week ago, um, lost her brother-in-law to suicide. And um, I was there when she got the phone call. And so we then went over to the house to um, see if we could help. And it's just talking with, with, with her and with the family and those involved. It just... I know that, her, that situation is dramatically different than than yours, um, but it just affects so many more people than um, anybody realizes, and it goes so far beyond what what those that are hurting intend. I think that it just and it's, it's life changing forever. It's a ripple effect. Yeah, and and. It was shocking to me to, I mean, when I realized that after it had happened, I didn't realize how much suicide affects not just the close family and the close friends, but it extends beyond mm-hmm. so many people. It extends to, you know, your friends, 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 Yeah. <laughs> even though that they weren't that close to him you know, the, the emotions and the impact that it has, it goes beyond and creates these responses to the, to the suicide that you wouldn't have expected. Yeah. The way that my son, my youngest son has been healing. He, <laughs> Bless his heart. He has found his way of dealing with it to tell everybody that he knows what's happened. Mm -hmm. Like we will go to the grocery store and be checking out and he'll tell the cashier, my dad killed himself and he's very straightforward and direct and the cashier will just stop and Nobody knows what to say. They don't, they don't know what to say to him. And he'll just, he'll turn to them and he'll be like, but I love him. <laughs> and he just moves on and good for him. that's his way of coping. But it impacts a cashier at the grocery store. Of course. And you know that when you walk away from that cashier, that cashier's thinking to themselves, wow, that little boy doesn't have a dad anymore yeah. because he committed suicide. And they're thinking throughout their day about the the impact that suicide has on someone's little family Mm -hmm. because they lost their dad. Yeah. One, one thing that I've seen or at least have learned in the last week being kind of a little on the outside looking in and seeing it is almost everybody who, actually kind of you know goes through with it the families and the loved ones that are left behind i think that immediate reaction is oh so fucking selfish like how dare you like what a horrible right selfish thing to do and i th- you know one of the things that um was told to me is that when the ones that actually do it most of the time are they think they're doing the most selfless thing possible. Yeah. That, that they are in a headspace where they feel like these people will be so much better off without me mm-hmm. that I need to not be here. And they don't even recognize the hurt that it may or may not cause. And I, I don't mean to take away from yours because I know yours was a, in a different setting and a different environment and there was some anger involved as well. But... I think even in that moment, he probably thought these people will be better off without me. That is exactly what he thought. And it's something that I came to realize and have compassion for. Mm -hmm. After a lot of therapy, I went through a year of weekly therapy after he passed away of doing trauma, PTSD therapy, EMDR. Mm -hmm. And I came to realize that he was just 
he was sick. He was mentally ill. And he felt like he had no other choice. Mm-hmm. And he, he had said to me, you would be so much better off if I wasn't here. That was his choice. His choice was to try and make my world easier without him. Sure. And I got to the point throughout therapy where I started to view our life together through his eyes, where I started having compassion for where he was Mm -hmm. and started to see how dark he was seeing his world and his life and the depression that he was in. And I felt so bad for, for him and how hurt he was, how much he was hurting inside. Yeah. And it put all aside, all of the, all of the pain that we went through and all of the bad stuff and our relationship and the suffering that we went through together. I was able to look at who he was inside and the suffering that he was going through. Yeah. All of those dark shadows that he was facing and wasn't able to climb out of, out from. And it was, it was really eye opening to be able to see that and to face the reality of where he was at because for so long after he passed away, I was so angry at him for abandoning my children and I, and for doing what he did Mm -hmm. and to be able to come back around, circle back around and be able to see him in a completely different light and actually have compassion for him was very, uh, enlightening not an easy thing to do. No, we... no. And it took me a long time to forgive him. Mm-hmm. And I have. Yeah. I've forgiven him. And it was a huge burden lifted off my shoulders when yeah. I did. Look at how, like, look at how what a beautiful uh, coping mechanism that your son has mm-hmm. when he's like, yeah, it's there. Mm-hmm. But I still love him. Yeah. He had to forgive him too. And it, is probably going to have to go through adult version of him forgiving him at some point too. But God, like from the mouth of babes, like what a beautiful way to, to look at the world is boy, dad did something that really sucked. You know, a lot but of I my, love him. <laughs> yeah. A lot of my healing has come through my kids. Mm-hmm. They've really opened my eyes and <laughs> While I was going through therapy, I, I really had this desire to learn and grow. I completely changed my mindset to have this growth mindset. And I dove in deep to psychology books and wanted to learn how the mind worked, wanted to learn how to help my children because I wanted to... I wanted to be the best mom I could to help them heal. Yeah. And in the process, they were actually teaching, teaching me through the experiences that I had in this healing journey. Yeah. There was one time I remember we went to, we were getting ready for my youngest birthday and I took him to Zurcher's and in front of Zurcher's, there was a, a booth for suicide awareness. I can't remember the um, foundation. They had a B as their symbol. Um, I'll have to look it up, but they were promoting their, their items out on their table to sell Mm -hmm. so they could earn money. And my son, my youngest son goes walking up to the table and he says, what's all this? <laughs> and the men start talking about what their purpose was saying. We're earning money to help people who with, 
who've, you know, had suicide ideation and obviously didn't say ideation because he's (laughs) eight years old and doesn't understand what that means. But they told him what they were there for. And he says, oh, my dad committed suicide. (laughs) And they stopped. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. And he's like, it's okay. What can I help you with? (laughs) And he's got his hands on his hips and he's just matter of fact. And they turned to me like, well, can he buy something? <laughs> I mean, is that okay? Is it okay with your mom? And I said, sure, yeah. He he's welcome to buy something. And they said, well, how expensive? <laughs> and, and I said, whatever, whatever he wants. And we'd we're happy to help. And so he's looking around and they start talking to him about each item. And he says to them, I want to help as much as I can can I just buy all of it? (laughs) And I was like, well, I don't know about all of it, but we could buy a few things. So we bought some stuff and he sat and talked to those guys for almost an hour about his dad and how much he loved him and how much he wanted to help their purpose. And I was just so taken back at his willingness to help the situation, to help other people and he already had the compassion for my husband at that point he had already forgiven him yeah kids have a remarkable ability i think to see our true self and just like accept us for for that version of us Mm -hmm. you know it's not until us adults start like proving them wrong or start or start doing things that make them guess, Oh shit, maybe, maybe that true self I'm seeing is, is incorrect. Mm -hmm. And then we spend all of our adulthood, adulthood fixing those things that, that adults taught us as kids that were wrong. Um, Mm -hmm. but they have that really natural ability to just see, see who we really are. Right. And to accept us for who we really are. Right. Um, so I'll tell you, you, as you were talking about, compassion and learning to accept um, your husband and kind of see where he was at. This is something that's always helped me in my life um, is, so I'll tell you a little bit about my childhood and growing up is my parents got divorced when I was 16 years old and I love my dad, but had had a, difficult relationship with him growing up um and this this came to me at a moment when i was still a member of the lds church and i served a two-year mission and even though through kind of junior high and high school my dad and i had had this tumultuous relationship i went out for two years and he was the only person who wrote me every single week like, even mom missed she's gonna hate this but even mom missed <laughs> an email or two but but my dad never missed and that was such a um misconception for me because i had these preconceived ideas about him and about our relationship and just by sending an email every week, he was proving me wrong about the level of love that I thought he had for me. And one day I kind of was doing some morning, morning study and morning meditation. And I was thinking about what God expects all of us here on earth to do. And I think, and I still think this, even though I'm, a little more agnostic now than I was then. Um, I think that the only thing that's required of us is to do our very best. That's it. Come down here, do your very best. Well, here's the thing. We're all dramatically different people (laughs) with dramatically different levels of maturity. And so Marie's best is way different than Nick's best. And my best is way different than 
the prophet of the Mormon church or than the kid in school who never, ever got in trouble. Our bests are completely different. And yet the only per, the only people who really know if we're giving it our best are ourselves and God. And so while I was thinking of this, for whatever reason, I just had this, like, just got hit with this realization where I thought, holy shit, what if my dad's doing his very best? Like, like what if, what if all these things that I'm angry with him for and that I have had issues over are his best? If I can't let go of those, I'm, if I hold a grudge against him, I'm not doing my best. And that's all that's asked of us. And so what I started doing from that moment forward, and I started with my dad, and I've since tried to apply it to other relationships in my life. I just assume they're doing the very best they can. And as soon as I assumed, hey, he's doing the very best he can, all of a sudden it became a lot easier to love him. And I have been able to do that with countless relationships afterward, whether it's a, a work relationship, a personal relationship. If I just assume that that person is doing the very best they can with what they've been given, then I can look past a lot and I can love them no matter what. And that's something that you reminded me of. Exactly. And I've come to that realization too. I've had a similar experience with my mom. And after I had a very strained relationship with her growing up, we're very similar. And so we butt heads mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> we, we would argue all the time growing up. And after my husband passed away, she really stepped up. And she was there for me, right by my side, anytime I needed her. And it was really eye-opening for me because before that, I felt like she hadn't been there for me mm -hmm. in the past. And that she, didn't, that she didn't care where I went in my life or what I was achieving. And so after he had passed away, when she was there, I was able to do what you said and see that she was, she was just doing her best. Yeah. And I see that now. Yeah. And don't let me, don't get me wrong. I think it doesn't mean that you give everybody a pass on things. That doesn't mean that there's not consequences for actions. Um, but boy, it just makes loving somebody a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And I would say the same thing about your husband. He was probably doing the very best he could. Yeah. Even with depression and anxiety and anger issues. And he was probably doing the very best he could. Yeah. And even if he wasn't, assuming that he was, where's the harm in that? Right. And I think we have to realize that there are so many people around us, I mean, random people that we come by every day, we don't know their struggles. Yeah. We don't know what they're going through. And a simple gesture, simple smile can go a really long way for somebody. Um, when it comes to like plastic surgery, someone like me who had the skin removal, I didn't do it for vanity. Mm-hmm. I did it for, for healing mm -hmm. to, like I said, to bring everything into alignment. Yeah. Well, you know me and my platform. I don't think there's vanity in any plastic right. surgery at all. Well, and that's, it all, all goes back into play where you don't know where com someone's coming from. Yeah, not at all. You have no idea where somebody's coming from. If somebody has you know, a scar they want to remove and they have plastic surgery to remove that scar because it left such a traumatic experience behind and they want to remove that traumatic experience. 
um before we jump more into the plastic surgery i want what so i know you i have obviously and you mentioned it too lots of therapy after this what sparked the um the the weight loss and the that shift where it's like hey i'm <laughs> i'm gonna love me now and i'm gonna lose weight and get to yeah. these other goals so what sparked my weight loss was actually the therapy mm-hmm. I started the EMDR and my first target for the EMDR was my experience with my grandma when I was eight. Mm -hmm. My therapist had said to me, what is your first memory that is traumatic to you? And it was that. It was my memory of my grandma telling me that my thighs were too big, Mm -hmm. that I couldn't be a ballerina. And so we started working on that target for my EMDR. And I remember we did maybe three sessions Mm -hmm. for that target, which is not very many sessions to remove a target. And I remember him saying something to me about, wow, that was quick. Like we we eliminated that target really fast. Are you sure that you feel good about this? And I was like, I feel great. Like, I feel like really good about myself. I feel really confident. And he had asked me on a scale of one to 10, how good do you feel about yourself? And, or maybe I should explain what EMDR is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been through it a little bit, but maybe talk about how it's done and how targets are removed. So EMDR is eye movement desensitization, uh, Reprocessing. That's right. I was like, shit, I don't remember what that was. <laughs> like, I got to remember it. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Maya in the back. Best friend in the back. Best friend. <laughs> so what they do is he had like a light bar that sits in front of me. And on the light bar, the light goes back and forth. And I follow it with my eyes. Mm-hmm. And then I had two clickers, one in each hand. And it vibrates in my hands. And... While I'm watching this, I, he talks to me and I'm replaying the memory in my head and whatever comes with that memory, I'm processing through that memory, you know, anything that comes up, your brain will process through any issues that were correlated with that memory. And Essentially, it's supposed to work through problem solve, I guess, that memory and help you work through that that trauma experience. I don't know if I explained that well. <laughs> um, so we worked through this target of my grandma telling me that I couldn't be a ballerina. And I felt so empowered after we did this EMDR session. And I was like, man, EMDR is amazing. Like this, this shit is like, (laughs) this is the bomb. (laughs) Like, can I do EMDR for all of my insecurities? (laughs) And then we got into like the really heavy stuff with EMDR. And I was like, I don't want to do EMDR anymore. (laughs) I don't want to hit my trauma. (laughs) I don't want to get into the heavy stuff. But no, it try, try ketamine therapy out. <laughs> yeah. But no, EMDR changed my life. It it, it really was amazing. Mm-hmm. It it healed me in a lot of ways. But going into the weight loss, after I did that EMDR target on me feeling better about myself and changing that mindset of how I viewed myself, I was able to look at myself as a different person. Mm -hmm. When I was going through the abuse with Travis, I had painted, I had done a painting. I had done a painting of a woman who you could see one side of her face and then the other side of her face was just fading away it was melting away and this painting i was put in a domestic violence traveling gallery Mm -hmm. 
I did it for the domestic violence gallery. And it was a depiction of me. It didn't look like me, but it was how I felt in my relationship that I was losing myself, who I was before my marriage, that I had completely lost. I had completely lost who I was. My bubbly, social, happy self was gone. And I was this empty shell of who I had been. And after going into the EMDR and addressing my trauma and what I had been through, I was able to face these issues that I had held back for so long. And I was able to rebuild inside and I guess meet the new me. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't that woman anymore. I was developing a whole new person And I had completely changed my mindset. And I was building up this new woman from that woman that had faded away. Yeah. That's when the weight loss had started. It wasn't, I wasn't focused on losing the weight in the beginning. I was focused on healing myself. Mm -hmm. And when I started focusing on healing the inside and healing myself, the weight just started coming off. Mm -hmm. I was focusing on being healthy. I wanted to be healthy. I wanted to live for my boys. I wanted to have a full life. And that just like consumed me that that need to feel full and to have a full life just took over. And my whole view on how I was living my life changed. I was eating healthy. I was hiking, I was doing yoga and meditating. I was diving into my spirituality. I mean, everything that I was doing completely changed. Everything, who I was, completely changed. I used to be a couch potato and I was a recluse. And (laughs) when I was married, I didn't leave the house. I had completely changed who I was. I wasn't going to see my friends. I wasn't going to see my family. That changed. Yeah. So a friend of mine would tell, used to tell me that in order to get to that next level of life or the next level or version of you, usually you have to kill the person you were and not just the person you were, but that whole life right. has to go away. And I have talked about my own similar experience on this podcast where I was looking at a life that I didn't love. I was really a slave to my work. I was missing things with my children. I was in a relationship that I knew I was unhappy in. My Health was terrible. Um, And that person had to go. Like, he had served me pretty well. Got me through medical school. Got me through um, some difficult times. But he had to go. And I saw my buddy do the exact same thing. And what's what's so funny is for you and I, killing versions of ourselves that were, that we did not like anymore... That was a hard thing to do for us. 
I saw my friend kill a version of himself that he really liked. Like, it was a good life. He was successful. He was wealthy. He would was dating whoever he wanted and was traveling wherever he wanted. But he knew that in order to be better, in order to be the next version of him, all of that had to go. Mm-hmm. And so he got rid of a version of him that was even harder to get rid of because it was one he liked. Um, but, okay, so you get through this weight loss. You do this beautiful weight loss journey. You found me. We do the mommy makeover. Mm-hmm. And I love, this is, here's the thing. You've had this beautiful journey, this beautiful breakthrough. It's not over. No. <laughs> no, it's just the beginning. Yeah. How's your boys? They're doing really good. Good. They're doing great. I mean, they're, my oldest has, he started playing the guitar after my husband passed away. And he just dove into music as his therapy. Mm-hmm. And he is a good guitarist. Nice. He has just taken to that. He joined the Hope Squad. That's a suicide awareness oh, okay. group at his school. And so he helps other students That's awesome. at his school with that. My youngest, he's just, <laughs> he's just, him (laughs) he's just this little ball of energy and Mm. he's great good he's doing really good i am going to school i'm full-time student and i'm going to school for public health Mm -hmm. and i dove into that right after my husband passed away so i've been doing that since since he passed away along with my healing journey nice and yeah i'm doing good um, I'm glad you came and shared today. Me too. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm proud of you, and I love like like the very small part that I played in this, because you went through a lot and you did all of the work. Um, and it's nice to be that little on top for you Mm -hmm. (laughs) um and again like that's one of my things that i have reiterated on this podcast again and again plastic surgery itself does not change you but it can sure help you see who you are it can sure help take away some pain it can sure help you come into alignment with who you really are you still got to do all that work I just, I just put the finishing touches. You just put the bow on. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. I'll take that role. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Naked Patient Beyond the Operating Room. I'm Dr. Nicholas Howland. Please remember that every patient who appears on this podcast has consented to discuss their story and their surgery on the podcast. That way we we remain HIPAA compliant. This is a free podcast. The best thing that you can do for us is to leave us a review online. Let us know what you liked. Let us know what you'd like to hear. Let us know how we can improve. If you are curious about anything related to plastic surgery, you can reach out to me on Instagram at Dr. Nicholas Howland, and I typically respond there, or you can reach us at the office at 801-571-2020, or we have an online form you can fill out at the website, www.howlandplasticsurgery.com. Any of our coordinators would be happy to help you. Thanks again for listening. Thanks for listening to the Naked Patient Podcast. Stay tuned for the next episode. Till next time.